everyone to the Modern Day Overthinker podcast. My name is Colin and I'm your host. Today I'm here with Lauren Wood. She is here to talk about a couple things with us today. She is a local Quad City. And did you grow up in the Quad Cities? Basically since fifth grade. Since in fifth Davenport, grade? Davenport, yep. Awesome, awesome. Where did you go to school at? Uh, Harrison, then Wood, then North. Okay. Yeah. All right, North. Yeah, <laughs> North always had, North had some characters. That's they, sure. yeah, they really have. Yeah, yeah, always had some characters. <laughs> but uh, and you've worked at you've had a variety of different jobs. Currently, you have your own publishing company. When did yes. that start? That actually started in two thousand and nine. Okay, so when I know. first like lost my first big girl job. Actually, when I first was starting to get diagnosed with my condition. Okay. Um, but I started a publishing company because I've always been a writer and. Loved writing and kind of wanted to publish my work and my friend's work. Did you go to school for writing at all? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Where did you go to school at? Um, Iowa and then Southern New Hampshire University. Southern New Hampshire. That's quite the difference. Did you go online? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yeah. So, so you didn't go to Southern New Hampshire. Yeah, I didn't go to, yeah. Physically. <laughs> didn't okay. actually go there. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is you can go all, so many different schools are online now. I know. It is kind of cool. You can go to, you can almost pick and choose and be like, oh, I just want to go to this you, if you're, I mean, if you're smart enough, I think you can go to Harvard online now. If you that's get true. In. They have like free well, Harvard. They classes. have like free Harvard classes. Yeah. I've heard about that. I need to look into that <laughs> for for marketing stuff. That would be really cool. But uh, yeah, I wanted to give you an opportunity. I always ever give everyone an opportunity to kind of introduce themselves and what what they do, and you know what we kind of wanted to talk about today, and we can kind of go from there. So I'll give you the floor here for a second just to introduce yourself to everyone. For sure. Well, my name's Lauren. I'm a local author and writer. Um, I have been here most of my life, I guess. Um, I moved away for college, but I ended up finding my way back. Um, How that goes. Yep. <laughs> and I I have schizophrenia, which is kind of why I'm here. And it's kind of a it's a big deal, and it it's sounds so scary. And um, but I'm just like anyone else um, when I'm on my medication, and so that's kind of why I wanted to come here today. Awesome. Yeah. Schizophrenia is one of those buzzwords where you're like, oh, that seems like a lot to deal with. And I'm it sure is. it is. <laughs> it can be. <laughs> but yeah, it could be maintained, though, obviously. A- absolutely. And you've seen both sides of that. I have. Yeah, I have. So when were you diagnosed with schizophrenia? Um, I was first diagnosed when I was 28. OK, wow. Yeah, late. A long time ago. Yeah. Does it? it so, schizophrenia is something it's something that shows up later, usually in for most people, right? Yeah, I think it shows up earlier in men and later in women. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's pretty typical for women to 20s. be in like your late twenties, yeah. And then men's more like early twenties. Yeah, it? early twenties, late teens. Okay, got it, got it. So yeah, it's one of those things that creeps up on you. And uh, so, how did you really notice things were different? Like, was there a certain event, or like, did it hit you all at once, or was it kind of like stead- gradually, like, oh? This it, is getting weird. Yeah, it, it kind of came on slowly and then kind of snowballed. Okay. I started getting really paranoid. Um, it definitely affected my work. I unfortunately lost my job, but it was before my diagnosis, so I didn't realize that it was like my mental health. They they were like, what is up they with this girl? Either, yeah, yeah, and I was like, what is up with me? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I just, I got very paranoid. You know that, that episode of um, It's Always Sunny where um, – I think it's Charlie. It has all the things connected. And oh, yeah. I literally had a whiteboard with that kind of stuff going on because okay. I thought someone was tracking me through the mail. Okay. So it was super just... Super paranoid. Yeah, super ridiculous. And it just spiraled and spiraled. And I ended up... I was living in Chicago at the time. And I ended up leaving Chicago, moving to Minneapolis, where I finally was hospitalized and diagnosed. Okay. So... Uh, did you go to... Oh, yeah. Minneapolis is in Mayo Clinic. That's Rochester. Um, yeah, I think it was just the the main hospital there. Yeah, but uh, that is – so that's quite the move, too. That's pretty far. It is. And actually, I I got diagnosed and put on some medication. Okay. Um, but I was living with friends at that time who didn't quite know what to do with me, so they kind of sent me home to back here with my mom. Got it. Um, and my mom didn't really know what to do with me because we hadn't heard of Vera French or anything like that. My, we didn't really have any mental illness in my immediate family. Okay. Um, and so I ended up kind of freaking out on my mom and leaving for California, oh. um, which is where I got put on like Haldol and the really heavy stuff where I finally was able to kind of get myself together. 
Okay. So it went from Chicago to Minneapolis. Here. Then to California. Then to California, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was like all over the place. All within the matter of how, what, what's the I, it time was, I think it was a, within the matter of like a year and a half. Wow. Yeah, I was like running from invisible people, basically. Okay, so yeah. yeah. Okay, I get it. Um, so you moved to California, and that's where you kind of were able to get a little bit more stability like yeah. as far as with the medication. Yeah, the medication, I mean, it really saved my life. It it brought me back to reality. I was suddenly grounded and could think straight and all the paranoia was gone and that's when I ended up coming back here. Okay, so you were just there for treatment then? Basically, yeah, I ran away to California because I thought I was going to like just live on the beach. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which classic. That doesn't work. <laughs> By the way. Yeah. Um and I went into treatment there and then came back home um with my medication and went into Vera French. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So about how long did it take for you to really start to get a grasp on things and then be like, okay, I think I'm good now. I think I can start, you know, maintaining a job and mm -hmm. and functioning in the real world again. Yeah, it took about six months and then I got a part-time job and then another six Gradually, months and I got a yeah. full-time job. Yeah, it just took a little bit of time to kind of get my feet underneath myself. Um, I didn't really like the weight gain side effect of the medication. It was very shocking to me because I'd never like been that big before. Um, and so I, I did let it go on for about 10 years and then I decided to stop taking my medication because you were frustrated. Yeah. I was like, I, I'm better. I don't have schizophrenia anymore. Like people can be cured. I'm sure I'm cured. Yeah. So I stopped taking my medication lost a ton of weight, went completely off the rails again. So mm. how long did it take once you were off the meds for it to really spiral out of control it long? spiraled pretty quickly yeah, yeah it was sure. about a six month period and yeah that yeah. sounds right yeah because the yeah those meds can get out of your system probably within a couple of weeks completely yep. and then you're just you're out there and you're just out there again <laughs> yeah i did a i was telling you before we started recording i went off my medication for anxiety and ocd it was an SSRI that I took for a long time. Uh, was I was on Prozac for, from like age 13, 14 until my early 20s. And I decided, you know, I'm good. I'm going to cut back on drinking, you know, any other substances. I'm going to stay away from everything and just work and I'll be fine. I even moved. I uh, moved from I was living in the city of Chicago and I moved to Schaumburg. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, I knew no one in Schaumburg, uh, <laughs> but my job was in Arlington Heights, and I didn't want to commute from the city to Arlington Heights. It was just too much. So I moved to Schaumburg, and I thought everything would be fine. It was not fine. It <laughs> it was it didn't take long for me to – it was it was like six months later. I was – like not even six months later, I was back home. I think it was like four months later I oh, was gosh. back home. Okay. Yeah, and – I got back on medication and, uh, well, they put me on a different medication and they gave me a bunch of Xanax and I was like, I felt like, uh, I was using that as a crutch and it just wasn't really helping. It was, it wasn't making my anxiety any better. It was just numbing me. Right. And luckily I didn't abuse it. Like I would, you'd think like with my addictive personality i would have abused it but i was kind of scared to because i've heard so many crazy yeah, stories I've heard about, about xanax Anna, yeah people just go to town on that uh, yeah so i was very like i only took the i was i was able to take like three of them a day and they were like the smaller ones okay and i would definitely take three a day usually <laughs> but i wouldn't go over that because i was scared and uh, i'm glad i had a healthy fear of that but eventually yeah, I came back home and got back on medication and was able to get things a little bit under control. I mean, things were still not the greatest, but they were a lot better. But that that time period was very it was just I get just got super depressed and just didn't want to do anything but sleep. And then I had to go to work because I had to pay my bills. But, right. but that that's was probably tough too. so hard. Oh, it was so hard. I called in all the time. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was terrible. That's rough. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Do you think? That you're okay because the meds are working. Right. <laughs> That's it's it's like a slippery, tricky yeah. thing. Yeah. And there are side effects. Yeah, there were side effects yeah. to Prozac too. I didn't like. It wasn't awakening. It was more like just like different 
Uh, some of it was like sexual side effects. Like no guy in their twenties wants that. Like, right, that's I don't... terrible. No, I was like, this is brutal. I'm in my twenties. <laughs> this is not good. And uh, that wasn't the main reason though, but that I tried it. And I think main the main reason was like I was like, I've never been off this. You know, I've been on it for so long. What's it going to be like if I'm not on it? And I found out. And I was like, okay, well, we're not doing that again. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you said with your medication, you were off for, you said how long? Six um, months? It was about six months. And then I was pretty much like lost to the world. Okay. And I, I mean, I, I burned so many bridges. I had such a wonderful like social network built up at that point, being back in the Quad Cities for 10 years. I had worked really hard I just lost so much weight and it had been like kind of a community effort because I was with a CrossFit gym Mm -hmm. and I had just so many friends and family and just everyone kind of together and then I stopped taking my medicine and um I just got so strange to people like over email and phone and in person and I just burnt so many bridges and kind of ruined a lot of relationships that I kind of look back and feel really bad about Mm -hmm. but you know, it is what it is. Um, I know now that I'm not ever going to stop taking my medication. If I'm a little overweight, you know, I'm overweight, but it's really important. Yeah. It's a better case scenario. Like, to, yeah. yeah, be a little overweight, then be completely out there and just totally burning not, bridges. Right. And, and just, oh my gosh, it was terrible. So did you think like, was it kind of like an everything, everyone's out to get me type of thing? Yeah, kind of. I thought everyone was out to get me. Um, I thought that people had like vendettas against me. I thought mm. my own mother was trying to kill me. It was outrageous. So and how has uh, your your family been like throughout most of this experience? Pretty supportive. Or? They have been. Yeah, okay. they my I'm so lucky to have the family that I have. They're they're so loving and they I mean, they've put up with a lot. So do you have any siblings? I have one brother. Okay. And uh, and you were the one that that pulled the short straw on the. On yep. The <laughs> yep. Right? He's he's normal. <laughs> Yeah, quote yeah. unquote. Come on, no one's really that. <laughs> right, right. What is normal? <laughs> very I mean, true. <laughs> yeah, so that's a very relative term. Is he older or younger? He's younger. He's uh, two or three years younger. Okay, got it. Uh, does he live around the area, or? Yeah, he lives here in Davenport. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, so what else did we want to get into? Oh, we wanted to talk about the stigma of mental health and mental illness in general, and your. Pers- particular diagnosis mm-hmm. i mean because like i said earlier when you get schizophrenia you're like oh man that's a big one yeah and it's a big word <laughs> well yeah. yeah i mean you think i mean if you can even spell it like i can't have to spell it half the time yeah, but yeah. you think you hear of like like in movies and stuff it's always like the serial killer is schizophrenic or mm. the stalker or the this or you the know bad guy. Yeah, yeah the bad guy and it's like statistically people with schizophrenia are more likely to be the victim of crimes and be the victim of things that are, you know, things like that. So they're not necessarily harmful. Um, And that's just kind of what I want to put out there. Like they're more of a harm to themselves than they are to someone else. Yeah, that makes sense. So when you had these, uh, when you were really like uh, thinking like everyone was out to get you and everything. So did you like kind of, isolate yourself or i did um it got to the point where i moved to an apartment downtown davenport i actually lived above abernathy's um and it was it's a cool spot but i i was just i was such a weirdo i was basically a shut-in um i could barely hold down a job half the time i was always switching part-time jobs and things like that because I always would think that my coworkers were against me. Mm-hmm. Um, so it just, it got weird. And then I, I fled to California for a second time. Okay. And the same thing happened. I went into treatment and I got back on my feet again. Is there a particular place? In, did you go to the same place in California? No, this time it was San Diego. The first time it was Los Angeles. Ah. Uh, so. Los yeah. Angeles, you can fit in being being a little crazy. I know. Everyone's crazy. Yeah. In Los <laughs> everyone's losing it there. Yeah. So. <laughs> I went to LA one time and I think I've talked about it before. I just felt weird immediately when I it's like, and it's getting so much worse. It's like so dirty there. It's a weird energy. It, it, um, it's just, very I'm strange. not really an energy guy and I'm just like, okay. <laughs> what like, is going on yeah. here? Yeah, it's weird. 
It's odd. I really want. I do want to check out San Diego, though. I've heard San Diego is really cool. Yeah, it's be- It's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's expensive, but it's but, awesome. Yeah, I wouldn't live there. I wouldn't live in. I wouldn't live in California. Oh yeah, gas is like eight dollars a gallon. <laughs> oh. Yeah, people like people wonder why we live where we live, and then you tell them what you pay for things, and they're like, "Oh, okay." I get, I get it. it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we kind of got to deal. We we got to deal with the winter, but it's it's a good trade off. It take really it. is, and the Quad Cities has come so far. It's such a oh cool place. so far, yeah. yeah. And, and you're, uh, did you work with Dan Bush on that new project? Was that you or was that no? Um, oh, actually, I know Dan Bush because I worked it's like you at, know Dan. I I worked at Jimmy John's like years ago. That was oh, so one of my part time jobs. Oh, cool. Okay, which one? Uh, the one in um, on Jersey Ridge and Eastern. Okay, I worked at Jersey Locust, Ridge and because I went to Ambrose. That's, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah, yeah, that was one of my part time jobs when I was kind of coming out of the first one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Dan's a good guy. He really is. Yeah, um, he's making the Quad Cities so cool. He's doing a lot of things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he yeah posted something about like what are some some things that you want to see in the Quad Cities? I said. I said, ridiculous mini golf course like Happy Gilmore. And I'm not joking. I want to see that. I <laughs> like want... with like a dinosaur that moves. Yeah, and, like, and a so big funny. clown and like the, <laughs> the most ridiculous. And we don't. We had one mini golf course. And it was right over there. And it got. And they. Yeah, they took it down. They took it down. I was I was so frustrated. I was like, I was like, man, I wish I had money. I would tell it. I would totally buy that. Because I will. I will not. That's like my retirement plan. I want to retire and and uh, build a mini golf course. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I want to design it, and it's going to be frustrating. <laughs> like just people freaking out every day. <laughs> people are going to be awesome. so upset playing the course. <laughs> well, it'll be challenging. Like, and the, well, I think the last and then the last hole has to be like one of those ridiculous holes. Like, if you make it, you like win a free like a free like season of golf or something. Or right, something. but it's like impossible yeah, to get like, it. But the, you can get it, but the odds are very very thin. <laughs> that yeah. sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I don't know. I and I yeah, I just love golf in general. Um, I've been golfing since I was. Um, I think I was like 10 or so. And I did the first tee thing, which shout out to Scott Stowe. I'm trying to have him on the podcast. I don't know if you know Scott Stowe. He's a musician, no. local musician. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, he actually lived out in LA for a while and moved back. Um, and um, yeah, I've been meaning to get him on the podcast. He's just very busy. He does a lot of uh, local music gigs. And then he's run the first tee program. Oh, uh, cool. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, which has been he's been they've been expanding it, and that's really cool. And, so you uh, probably love the John Deere Classic being here and all that. Yeah, I don't go because it's so hot though. Oh, that's it is always it's like so, the hottest. It's July, yeah. and it's just yeah. like I'd rather just play, I, right, and be miserable than watch it be miserable. I don't know. <laughs> and I don't drink anymore, and that's a big part of it too. That's like, true. Like people that like is, people there, just go get drunk. People and, just go get hammered, yeah. and like yeah, whatever you want to do, man. But that's not me. Um, I do like it. That's a cool attraction. I want to play the course, and I heard that. I didn't know until recently, but if you live in the Quad Cities, and I, um, I think I mentioned it because I talked to my buddy Carson about golf when he was on here, but you can get a discounted rate. Like, oh, you live cool. Because okay. otherwise it's really expensive because it's like a professional course. Right. But you basically pay to get your ass kicked because it's like really hard. It's hard, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's cool though. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever golf, but it's frustrating. No, I cannot golf. I went one time and I just ended up getting drunk on the golf court. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is uh <laughs> that's another option as well. That's what some people do. Yeah. Some people do both. <laughs> yeah. Uh, golf. Um, yeah, I'm good at a lot of a lot of uh, leisure sports like golf and bowling and stuff like that just the real hard stuff that really takes athleticism the, the real difficult stuff. i'm yeah. not an athlete <laughs> I, uh, but i pretty good hand-eye coordination nice so that's uh <laughs> no my sister was the athlete in the family i mean my brother were not uh okay. as much we played baseball but we kind of like we're on the team <laughs> like the thing. b team <laughs> yeah we were okay. on the team but uh yeah so the stigma with with schizophrenia, because yeah, when I hear schizophrenia, the first thing that comes to my mind, and it's not the right thing, but it is like I think of like a homeless guy, right? Like that's like off his meds, like talking to himself. And I I actually was homeless two times in my life okay. because of this. When I went off my medication, I got so bad to the point where I was homeless, and then I kind of found my way into treatment. And okay. so I mean, you're not wrong 
Um, I know a lot of people who have had schizophrenia have dealt with homelessness at one point in their life. It's just you lose you just lose the ability to deal with reality to the point where you just can't function at all. Yeah. So, yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of homeless people, I think, do deal with mental health oh. issues, which is really sad. Yeah, mental health issues. And then you add on substance abuse usually. Because, right. uh, yeah, it just goes hand in hand. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the publishing company. So sure. you said you started that after uh, losing losing a job and you're like, I want to do something on my own mm -hmm. and you always like to write. And so what type of, uh, publications are we talking about here? Um, when I first started it, it was very like, it's, it was abstract stuff cause I was kind of going off the rails. So the first thing I published was just some ridiculous thing. It was like a graphic novel that made no, like no sense. Mm. Like if you can understand it, you know, good for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at this point, I've published like short story collections and children's books. Okay. So which is really fun. I heard children's go books go really well. If I mean, if they take off, obviously. Yeah. yeah, it's it's hard to get an independent book to take off without like sinking a lot of money into the marketing. Um, which I don't do. So I yeah. just, I'm like, Hey, we have a book. Yes. I'd like to work with local, author, local illustrators. Oh, illustrators. Yep. Okay. And do you do all the publishing and then put it like on like Amazon yeah. or, okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you brought up always sunny. I love that show. I, I'm it's not so caught. Funny. I'm not up to speed because there's been so many seasons now. Right. I kind of fell off, but I need to go back and watch them. But like those old, those old episodes, those old, those first few seasons, are just, <laughs> they were so funny. Just so I watched actually in the hospital, and I had to watch it because I was laughing so much, and I just had an epidectomy. Oh my god! <laughs> so you're like, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was worth it. It was yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah, because I had an epidectomy in Mexico uh, while are I was on spring serious? break. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh my god, that is like got to be so scary. You would think so, but I was in like the nice resort area of Mexico. Okay, okay. The hospital I went to was super nice. Okay. It was very it wasn't like on a donkey like no, behind a tortilla no. stand yeah, they like gave me a shot of tequila <laughs> no it was nothing like that okay good. but it was different because here they do it laparoscopically and there they like cut they actually like kind of cut i have three scars like one here and one up here and one over here they oh my gosh like go in there and and get it they apparently in the u.s uh at that time this was 15 years ago so at that time they could do it like in one day in the U.S. But there I was there for a couple of days. I had to stay overnight and stuff, which oh, okay. really screwed up my vacation. I bet. Oh yeah. my god, what a bummer! Yeah, it was my, my it was my uh, senior trip that I had with a bunch of friends from high school. Oh no! And yeah. you're like, sorry guys. I, I had a blast a before that happened. <laughs> I bet it was really fun and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was all inclusive. The drinking age was eighteen. And I had just turned eighteen, like right when we got there, like cause my birthday's in March or when spring break is. Oh, perfect. And uh, yeah, everybody was like, I woke up one day and everybody's like, "Hey, oh no!" I was like, "Hey, um, I don't feel good." And then I, I, they're like, "Oh, you're just hungover." I'm like, mm. and I couldn't move. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't move, and I had this like pain, sharp pain in my chest. I'm like. I don't think this is a hangover, guys. <laughs> You're like something is seriously yeah, wrong. So they had like a on call like nurse and at the resort we were staying at, and they came. They're like, "Yeah, you need to go to the hospital now." Oh no! And oh I was like within hours, like within like an hour or two of it bursting, which would have been really bit. Really oh bad. no, that would have been so bad. Yeah. Oh shit. So that was uh, <laughs> that was interesting, and the insurance situation was tricky too. My my dad had to like put like a credit card down because they wouldn't t take our insurance oh no and then oh he had to God. file a claim once he got back i still don't know how much it ended up costing like with insurance and everything um oh, i've been meaning to ask my dad that because he'll tell me <laughs> um he'll remember too uh, <laughs> i bet <laughs> not like to throw it in my face but he'll remember yeah because uh, he's a numbers guy but <laughs> it's yeah it was wild um i'll never forget that and people and i always make people would my friends that were there would make jokes and be like, oh, because also while I was there, they did an ultrasound to see like how bad it was before I went into surgery. And they were like, yeah, it's really bad. I mean, it's bad. We need to get you into surgery. But also you only have one kidney. And I was like, what? I was like, 
I was like, pump the brakes for a second. My mom and then my mom's in the room and she's like, what? And I'm like, mom, uh, isn't this something like we should know about? Like what's going on here? And this was before the surgery. And, uh, so that everybody jokes around. I was like, oh, you got your kidney taken in Mexico. <laughs> and, so funny. and I'm just like, nope. That's just when I found out I either had a kidney at some point when I was younger and it okay. never developed okay. or I was just born with that one. Wow. Yeah. They didn't just secretly say, oh, you don't have one. No, they, they showed took it. it. They, they sh- took it out and sold like, it. When I could see <laughs> like what they were looking at. They could show you. Oh, I mean, my god! I didn't really... No, exactly. But my mom was very like was paying attention right away <laughs> when bet. that happened, and and because she didn't know either, because um, it's just one of those things. It's just really bizarre. Apparently, like it's like one in like two thousand people just don't have another kidney or twenty five hundred. Yeah, don't have another kidney. And you only oh need one, you only need one to function. Obviously, people right. donate them and stuff. Right. But don't ask me to donate a kidney. I can't do that. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, unless <laughs> unless I'm on my deathbed, then you can have it. Okay. <laughs> I'm not the candidate. I'm not the guy. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it was wild. It was bizarre. That is wild. Wow. Yeah. Being, but before that, it was, uh, for all that, it was a good time. Uh, yeah. All inclusive, all that stuff. And anyway, that was when I was, my drinking was a little bit more in control. And, oh, okay. Um, when did it kind of like get out of control? Do you think? Uh, it escalated. It actually wasn't really necessarily the drinking that got out of control. It was what happened once I started drinking. I would seek other substances. And oh, then it would, okay. Things would just go off the Spiral. Rails. Okay. That's... And then I'd be out till like four in the morning or six in the morning. And it would just, it, it just got really bad. Um, okay. So it, it, I had to cut out drinking because it, um would let my guard down to just doing dumb things. Okay. And so, because I, I wasn't always like every time I drank, I'd black out. It wasn't like that. I did have blackouts I, and, and I was getting more of them and I think it was getting worse, but it wasn't to a point where like I was drinking every day. I was blacking out every day. I was oh, going good. Through okay. a fifth a day. I wouldn't consider myself like, that's why I say I'm, I'm an I'm an addict. I'm an addictive person. Mm. I'm not an alcoholic. I think that's too uh, um too general of a statement for me. And it's not it doesn't make sense to me to call myself an alcoholic cuz that's not really what it was all about for me. Mine was just like what give me something that makes me feel way better and that gets me out of my head and a lot of self-medicating. Okay. Was mainly what I look when I look back on it, it was a lot of self-medicating and I didn't know what else to do. Um, I just went, tried to do with what I do, whatever worked and it stopped working, but I still kept doing it anyway. And that's one of those things where you're like, okay, then, you know, you have a problem if right. you're repeating the same thing, knowing what's going to happen. It's just complete insanity. It is. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're smart to have like taken control of that. Yeah. It was, uh, it came to a point and I, I talked about it on my, uh, solo podcast where I got to a point where it was just like. I was sick of like blowing all my money and then, you know, most responsible adults uh, have some type of rainy day fund or extra money set set aside when something happens. Right. Uh, I did not. I never had that because all my money went towards partying and um, I got my car towed and I didn't have money to get it out. And I had to ask somebody for money. It was my parents. It was usually my parents that I asked for, for money and I was just sick of doing that all the time. I'm like, I'm. I was 27 at the time. I'm like, this is just getting old. I can't live like this anymore. And just like, I'm cashing out. I'm done. Good for you. <laughs> That's good. That's smart. Yeah. So, cool. yeah. When this episode, this episode will be released on Monday, which will be the di- the last day that I got drunk. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, six years ago. Six years ago. Wow. That's like a long time. Yeah weird is it do you ever think about going back yeah all the time i not like but i don't entertain it i I mean it's impossible not to think about it like some people will say say like oh i don't even uh if somebody says like they don't think about it at all i think they're lying uh personally uh because you're gonna i mean you're it's it's around i I mean i i do comedy i perform i see people drinking all the time and yeah i don't know how you do comedy without drinking like that is (laughs) amazing 
I don't know how to do it the other way, which is good. Okay. Because uh, <laughs> I've only done it. I've only done it sober. So, uh, yeah, like, but I'll occasionally go out and hang out at, at bars with people with my friends and they'll be drinking or whatever. I don't really hang out with people who like drink like heavily. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, most people respect it. Like I've heard stories about, you know, people having people like, you know, giving them a hard time about not drinking. I'm like, I don't hang out with those people. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> so that's, what's the point of that? I don't, yeah. I don't have time for those people. Those people stopped calling me years ago anyway. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, they don't contact me. And, uh, so, yeah, substance abuse is, is one, one thing that, you know, people turn to just when they're going through mental mental illness and issues with just life in general. It's, it's just this very, especially drinking. Mm-hmm. just because it's so accessible and i lived downtown for a while and that's when that's when things really i think escalated for me that when, bad? I, when i lived downtown because it was just i just would walk outside and go to the bar i could do that yeah. all the time and and i will tell you i i don't know why i got schizophrenia like i have no idea like what precipitated it yeah i have it in my like extended family a little okay. bit i have a couple cousins um and an uncle that have it um but all through high school and my early 20s i was a really heavy drinker okay. and i just drank like crazy um and i abused diet pills oh um fentermine okay and so um so kind of like what it was it kind of like speed yeah okay and so i did that a lot um and sometimes i look back and i wondered you know did that contribute to my diagnosis because i i mean i just went is there what yeah i guess i mean i have no idea if there's a correlation or not yeah it's tough to say i think i already had depression before i used substances but i think it made my depression and my brain chemistry worse worse yeah oh yeah i'd be shocked if it didn't yeah like i watched a, a video of someone was talking about um it was one of the Lawrence brothers was ta- who is in recovery. Matthew, I think, Lawrence. You know what I'm talking about, right? I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, I should know. From uh, oh, There was a show back in the day. Um, it was based in Philadelphia. And there was like, but not, not like Fresh Martin Prince. Lawrence? No, not Martin Lawrence. Like the Lawrence brothers, um, they are... Oh, man. Um, there's an older <laughs> one and a younger one. Okay. And they're both actors. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think what the name of the show is. But anyway, he has a podcast, and he or he was on a podcast, and he was talking about how he knew how he worked with Robin Williams. Oh, wow. And um, when he worked with Robin Williams... There was one time and he was a kid and he was working with them. And then he, uh, you know, they had already done like the scenes for the day or whatever they were doing. And he went to Robin Williams dressing room and he just like, and he didn't know better, but people kind of avoided Robin Williams when he was off stage, um, at certain times because he was very like, um, he was very, he can, he got really depressed and got in to certain episodes and uh okay. apparently he went backstage and uh went in his dressing room and rob williams uh was just like on a tape like had his head just oh, no. like this just as soon as he walked in or like this like you know like just tip- like just stressed out himself yeah just like the like if he like when he wasn't performing and he wasn't on stage he was just like miserable um, it's basically what he described it as. And I was like, damn, I'm not like that, but I do like being on stage a lot because since I've been doing it, it is kind of like, a, almost kind of like chasing a high in a little, in a sense. Okay. Um, do you feel like all that stuff like evaporates when you're on stage and making people laugh and something gets shut off Okay. and I turn in and not all the time. If I have a really bad set, it doesn't really necessarily go that well, <laughs> but it like, if I have a good set and think people are laughing and I get kind of in the in a groove and it just feels like you're like 
uh, it feels like for just like a pretty second, you're like untouchable. That's it's, awesome. It's crazy. It's a crazy <laughs> feeling. And um, yeah, it's like a, it's, it's like you got the, I think Don, Donnie said something about it like the other day when I saw him. He said he, he got the itch or you got the, or you got the virus. The virus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Something weird because like, right. it's Donnie. <laughs> yeah. it, I I really want to have Donnie on. I had to talk to him about it. Um, he would be good to have on. Here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's 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 a great dude. Uh, he's uh, he's one of my. F- I, I people people got mad at me for saying like uh, I posted on because uh, I run the Quad City Stand Up page. I started that. To oh, help, that was you. Okay, yeah, cool. To help like promote shows and stuff because I was like, you got like. There's a lot of good comedians, but there's a lot of people that really just suck at marketing. They do. I, like, no one cares. No one wants ca- to. I they know. don't care about it at all. They're just like, they just expect people to just show up at these shows. I'm like, they don't know about them. <laughs> right. Um, so I started the page to help promote shows and things like that. And I remember posting, like, to try to get engagement up. I was like, well, who's your who's your favorite Quad City comic? And they're like, and people were not happy about me doing that. And I was like. I thought it was a good post. I remember posting yeah. on it. Yeah, I yeah. thought it was awesome. Yeah, and I think I and I commented as myself, and I said, "Yeah, like Donnie's one of my favorite, and he's always been one of my favorites because he's just out there, and he's uh, he's been doing it for, I would say it's between ten and fifteen years. I think. Yeah, it's a long. It's time. over ten years. So, and it just you just never. He's just a complete wild card too. He is. You never know what yeah. he's gonna like. Come yeah. up with. I mean, he's not Mike Adralis. Mike Adralis is a total <laughs> wild card. Right. I like, loose can of wild card sometimes. But Donnie, it's like, you know, it's going to be funny. And sometimes it won't make that much sense, like the bird room and stuff. And but it's like, still so funny. It's so funny. He's just like, <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, he would be a great guy to have on that because he's, he's super smart, too. He is. Yeah. Very smart. And, um, but yeah, he's very, like, when you're, when he's off stage, he's very he's, he could be very quiet. But once you get him going on something, he'll he'll go. Yeah, he'll go. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he'd be a great person to have on. I was just about to have him on, but I wanted to have a little break in between because he was just on Zach's podcast. Oh, so I wanted to have a little break, break in between. Yeah. I didn't want to be like have him jump from Zach's podcast to my podcast and uh, take away any of the listeners from that or anything like that because I'm not in competition with somebody. Uh, right. So. I'll eventually have him on. Um, yeah, uh, Tony would be another one to have uh, on here. Tony Cavallo. Oh, he's hilarious. Oh, my God, yeah. He's so inappropriate. I love Tony <laughs> He's, he's, <laughs> he's so, so funny. <laughs> he is br- – he's just – he's brutally honest. He is. Yeah. He is, but I, like, appreciate that. Yeah, some people do not care for that. Man. No, I'm there's like, a lot of people that don't. <laughs> it's funny. I'm just like, all right. And he's <laughs> – yeah, and he's he's a very, very much a um, he's an he's he's an artist. He's just one of those art artists that's just very. He sees he his perspective's just so different. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way he sees things, it's cool though. It's yeah. like a good perspective to like see things that way. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, he's talked to me a couple times about about mental health and stuff like that um just like in passing or like for a while it was like that was the only thing. he didn't really know me that well so that and he knew me because of the podcast and uh and because of comedy so he would bring it up and talk about stuff i'm like we could talk about other stuff dude like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's yeah he's just He's always been cool with me, so I know yeah. he, I know some people he's pissed off, but he doesn't care. <laughs> he doesn't. I know, which is great. <laughs> he doesn't he care. He shouldn't all. care. He I mean, he's care. hilarious. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Um, and he's kind of he kind of is one of those guys. Like, there's a lot of comedians that'll pop in for a while, and then you won't see him for a while. Then he'll mm-hmm. pop in again, and um, he's been popping up more lately, which is good. It is good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, think he was really busy with that um oh, yeah. restoration project. Is that done now? I think so. It's it's been a while. It has. It's a big thing. It's cool. I'd be interested to see what kind of stuff they have that they're gonna do there. I well, I know, I know that do you they know much they about have. It? What's it called again? 
I don't know. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> the, it's an old theater. Yeah, it's. I keep wanting to say the Adler, but the Adler no. is the one that's open. Yeah, it's an old theater, and then they have apartments above. Okay. So and they rehab those too. Yeah, and they've started like talking to people about the apartments. Okay. Because I got an email about it, and they were like, "Come down and see the apartments." And I'm like, "Okay." Are you living on the Iowa side or Illinois? Iowa side. side. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I think they're income restricted though. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is a lot of apartments downtown now. Yeah. Is... I noticed that, yeah. I wouldn't mind living downtown again now. Um now that I have a different you know, agenda, I guess. Right. But yeah, they're income restricted and it's either they're income restricted or they're like two thousand dollars and it's like ugh, uh yeah. I would rather buy a house than pay two thousand for a Yeah, I have a mortgage here, so I'd rather just keep at that right. even though my house is worth like i got it five years almost five years ago and the market value is just insane right now nice and, um that's how it is anywhere though yeah uh, like especially like if you're in bed door bed door even crazier yeah that's everybody's true. moving to bed door i know better dwarf <laughs> yeah they think so <laughs> but yeah, a lot of develop, a lot of development in Bender, a lot of develop, but there's a lot of development. Yeah, downtown Dev, and then they're yeah. gonna have that theater. I know it's gonna be so cool. I don't know much about those guys, but they're interesting. Um, do you know much about? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't. It's two guys that uh, they've made some solid movies. Oh, the movie theater. The movie theater. Yeah, that's cool. Those yeah. guys are cool. Yeah, they made good movies. Yeah, they've made. It, do they? Are they? from here or if they just live here part-time i think they're from bettendorf okay gotcha yeah i'm trying to think of the name of that place i know it's very much in the beginning stages right it's such a good location though oh yeah like right it's like that whole avenue is like so cool there's like raccoon motel oh so sweet mm-hmm. the record store um and you everything go to oh, so is right sweet there. now that it's like a full like dine-in experience now. i know and they have a chef down there. She's not messing around. Tiffany does not mess around. She's I met her. Awesome. I met her a long, like when she was first getting started, because I lived in those apartments across from the library. Oh, cool. Okay. Like right where her shop was. And right. I, yeah, I went down and talked to her. She's really, really nice lady. Very, very driven. She's very good at what she does. Nice. Yeah. Well, I know she's on like the Food Network and stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. She had like a show, or she won a contest or something like that that doesn't surprise me yeah it's really cool yeah well she's perfect for camera she's very like i know i love her instagram stories are so funny yeah she's funny she's pretty she's just like perfect for i know uh yeah she's adorable (laughs) it's yeah she's perfect for her own social media um which yeah that's something i'm trying to work on right now is doing my own social media marketing company yeah i was gonna say don't you have a company yeah yeah it's a re relaunch i tried to start this company like seven or eight years ago but i was still like i was just not in a good place uh Mm -hmm. to do it and i was very all over the place and didn't end up working out so i just kind of put it on the back burner and uh or i just forgot about it i didn't know if i was ever going to do it again and I, i always liked the name and i Got the logo redone and revamped it, built the website, and it's very much like a full service marketing experience. Like I can do a lot, basically anything online I've done over the years. I've done, you know, running people's social media accounts to creating content for them to editing content for them. And, you know, I've done a lot, I've done a lot of work on building websites as well. Cool. Uh, so I want to provide people with uh, a quality experience when it comes to social media management, but also not destroy their budget. And, you know, I understand that, you know, these small businesses, they don't, they're doing it themselves to save money, but they're, what they're doing is they're making it worse for themselves um, either cause they're not focusing on their business or they're, or when they do do social media, they think they're doing it well and they're not at all. Right. <laughs> and they're not consistent. You have to be consistent 
Like, that's the thing with Tiffany. Like, she doesn't need a social media manager. I mean, she might have somebody that helps her, but... She knows what she's She doing. just does it. <laughs> right. She's on it. Um, she probably has a calendar that all her schedule, like, when she's going to do stuff. And she's very organized. Um, but most business owners are not... They're good at what they do, and they stick with that. And that's what I want to do is, like, hey, you stick with what you do, and let me take this off your plate, and... Yeah, obviously I'm going to charge you, but I'm not. I'm going to be reasonable about it. That's good. Um, because I want to help, the, especially as I'm getting new businesses and starting out. Because you're helping me because I'm learning. I continue to learn more the more I uh, work with clients because there's just so much to learn and there's so much going on in online marketing. And it continues to grow and it's only going to be more necessary as we continue to go on yeah like if true. you're not if you're not doing stuff on social media and you're unless you're a b2b company then it really doesn't matter that much i mean maybe linkedin but you don't even really need that that much but if you're business to consumer and you're not doing social media and you're not consistently active on social media you, you are doing it wrong unless you're like a business that's been established for like a hundred years. That, right. Like you're like Nike or something. Yeah. Or you're just like a local, some, there's some local companies around here that don't have a Facebook present, but presence, but they're so big and they're so well known and people know them and their word of mouth is just so strong that it doesn't right. matter. That's true. Um, and I'm not going to even contact them <laughs> because of the why. Right. Cause there's no, there's no reason for it. Right. Uh, but, you know, those those companies that that need that extra revenue um, or could use that extra revenue and, you know, the cost analysis, the return on investments there, mm -hmm. like it's just explaining that to them. And that's where I'm at right now and kind of building who I want to talk to, what kind of businesses I want to work with uh, specifically um, and go from there so i'm just doing like lead generation right now so i'm in the beginning stages of that i've had only had one client so far and we did a really i did a really good job for them and cool. um they uh taught me a lot and um so now i kind of know what my skill sets are a little bit better and i can focus on that and go from there so but yeah social media is uh it's one of those things where there's a lot of power in it and that could be used for good. And, you know, unfortunately there's a lot of negativity and yeah. getting back into talking about mental health. Like there's so much good stuff that I've run across and so many cool creators that are doing a lot of uh, mental health awareness or they're talking about their recovery and from mental illness or from reco recovery from addic addiction, alcoholism, whatever you want to call it. And uh, there's a lot of cool content like that. And that's why, I like doing the podcast and that's why I like doing the videos now, the video now so I can pull clips and, uh, it, cause a lot, a lot of people are like me. They don't even listen to the whole podcast. They just watch clips cause they're ADD like me. <laughs> and, um, so it just gives people another way to realize that, you know, that they're not the only person dealing with these types of issues and it spreads the awareness and slowly breaking the stigma of you know people not wanting to talk about what's going on with them which is so good yeah yeah it's important and i did that today i mean we had a work meeting um and i was telling you about it earlier where there, somebody was taught where they're trying to focus on different things for mental health month and they had, we had a work meeting where we talked about uh addiction and recovery and there was a lady that um that ran the meeting and she shared her story and then she opened it up and i was like you know, I, you know, this is like a work environment. I have a very professional job and I'm like, what do I want to talk? What do I want to say? But I was just like, you know what? She said some stuff. I, I was like surprised that she would say, you mm -hmm. know, and I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be open and share. I'm not gonna, I didn't, I'm gonna go, I didn't go all into it. I didn't say, oh, I did these drugs and all this <laughs> stuff. And, but I, I did make it clear that I was not just somebody that abused alcohol. I was like, I had a problem with many things. This is what I did. And this is why I am here right now. And I want people to know that I am here. And, you know, if you want to, like, 
message me and if you have a problem or have questions i am an open book and i am willing to um because i and i've and i've built a little a tiny little there's a couple people at work that i've that have figured out that that i go to meetings and stuff like that and so they'll be like hey you and they'll like private message me (laughs) and uh so that's been cool and i think that doing that meeting today and me opening up about it like people know like that there is someone else to talk to and i just like was raw about it i didn't like i said i didn't get completely but i said some stuff i probably like a couple of years ago i would have, i wouldn't have said it i would have been like oh you can't say that you're gonna get fired and like no they have it they had this meeting like right they opened the door it wasn't a recorded meeting too i made sure of that <laughs> but uh, it's good to be vulnerable sometimes yeah i was like, just like i want to know i'm like i'm like i at first, I was like, as she got to talking, I was like, I got I to gotta say something. <laughs> um, I knew I wanted to talk and, like, share a little bit and be open, but I wasn't sure how open I was going to be. But I was like, you know what? Screw it. I, there is a way out, and there's light at the end of the tunnel. You can change your life. Like, I completely changed my life. Like, I am not the same guy I was six years ago. Um, not even close. It's ridiculous. It's just, I'm not like a completely, completely different. I'm a better version of myself. I was just like on like autopilot for so many years, just mm-hmm. doing the same thing. And not many people really knew me. They knew different versions of me that I would just like, I was just a chameleon that molded into wherever I went. And you had like so many like acquaintances, but no like close relationships. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Didn't have any really, and the people that I was close with in the past, they kind of stepped back because they're like, he's partying a little too hard and (laughs) we don't really want to be involved in that. We have, you know, good jobs and yeah, me, I was jumping from job to job, bartending and oh gosh, yeah, the service industry is rough. It is. It is hard. It's so like. As long as you show up to work and do your job, like they don't care. They really don't. It's almost like encouraged some places. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, you're the weird one if you don't participate. Yeah, if you don't participate or don't. I mean, there's, I've worked places where they like give you shift beers and. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like. The, yeah, this, my company does like a happy hour thing too. Like, um, they used to do a happy hour when we were in person and I, I would never attend it. I would just go home. I was just like. <laughs> I'm out of here. Um, and I had to commute too. So people understood that. And yeah. Then, and sometimes they would have food though, which is nice. But, take some of that on the way. Yeah. I'll take some food. <laughs> you know, but happy hour. Yeah. It's kind of, I, I, I don't want to sound like the, uh, the weird, like dude who doesn't drink, but like, I think it's kind of weird that they push that on people. Yeah. It's, it is a, I mean, it's like, a social norm at this point like drinking is like should, i don't think it should be a social norm okay um uh, just eh, well i shouldn't say it like that it's like kind of a controversial statement um because i don't think people should not, not be allowed to drink but i don't think it should be as like socially acceptable to do it everywhere right. <laughs> like, like it should be more like like pot smoking, like yeah. kind of frowned upon a little bit. Yeah, like okay. the way that people approach weed, like smoke it at your house. Right. Um, like do that on your time. Yeah, do that on your time. Um, or yeah, or you know they have bars. That's where you go to drink and um, or have a cocktail or wine with dinner or whatever. But like, yeah, encouraging people to drink after work and. Um, you don't know which, you know, which people are, um, you know, more sensitive about that. Like, I'm not that sensitive about it, like where it doesn't affect me. Mm-hmm. But when I think about young people that are just trying to get sober, like then they see a happy hour after work and they're like on day two and they're like, uh, well, it's right there. Everybody it's happy there. hour. Yeah. yeah. That's that's got to be really hard. Yeah, that's good. It's tough, and people don't think about things like that. And um, and I think I think college really exacerbates it because oh I went God. to Iowa. Yep. 
and there was a there was a bar there that did like 25 cent pictures of long islands and it's like are you trying to kill us like yeah like it it was just outrageous yeah because it's just like i and and also when you're talking about possibly i'd rather have i'd rather you know be around stoners than people drinking any day really oh yeah okay um just because well for one they're way less harmless <laughs> They don't usually get violent. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, I mean, not everybody's a violent drunk. There's the happy drunks, too. I was more of that. I'd fall into that category. I'd never really got violent at you know, when I got drunk. That wasn't me. I never got in fights or anything oh, like good. that. Oh, good. That's good. Yeah. Um, and, but when it comes to, I think weed's way l- less harmful. I, I do think there are some things about weed that people need to talk about more like it's not for everybody right um it's not as harmless as everybody says it is either but if you put it against alcohol it wins for sure because it doesn't do as much damage no it doesn't do as much physical damage like alcohol you're drinking you're technically drinking poison (laughs) (laughs) your liver is filtering out like hard stuff yeah with weed the only Bad part about it is if you're smoking it, you shouldn't be smoking anything because your lungs aren't right. built to handle smoke. But that's like beyond that. Like it's like I and if you you can you can handle. Like I know people that that smoke all the time, and I didn't, and, and like I didn't even, I didn't even know they did all the time. Mm-hmm. Like they just like that's just that's just their are. normal. With way. me, like you knew I was ripped. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it very well. Either. <laughs> yeah, you, you know I'm. Yeah, it's it doesn't work that way for me. Like, I can't get away with it. Even if I think I'm getting away with it, I convince myself that everybody knows. They're <laughs> thinking my thoughts. Yeah, it just. Yeah. Ah, I get. It wasn't always like that, but it hit a point like where every time I smoked, I would I would feel that way, and I was like, ah. And the the weird thing is, I can say with schizophrenia, like. That paranoia that you get and that weird, those weird thoughts and stuff. It's the same. It's very similar. similar. similar yeah, it's same, very, very similar. similar. Yeah. And I. But like in a bad way, not like in a fun way. Not in a fun way. No, not, not a fun not way. Not like a tripping way. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, man. I was always scared to do any type of hallucinogen. Yeah, I've never done that. I was too scared. Yeah. Um. I was like, nope, I'm going to be the guy that has a bad trip. I'm going to be the guy where he gets stuck this way my whole life. I'm like, nah. I know. You hear those stories and you're like. Oh, yeah, they're really rare, but okay. like, I don't. I don't want to risk it. I don't want to <laughs> risk it. I'm good. I'm like, I already got enough going on up there. I don't need any more. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I've had a couple friends or one friend in particular told me about a trip that he had that was really bad. And I was like, nope, that, that, uh. Sounds horrible. Sounds terrible. I'm good. <laughs> but I'm trying to think, uh, where are we at in time? I don't, I don't want to be mindful of that. Um, so we talked about the medication. I'd be, uh, let's talk about uh, well, let's talk about therapy. So have you done it? Any th- have, I'm, are you currently doing any therapy right now? Or um, I did therapy for a while. Okay. Um, I did a lot of talking through like. I had a lot of shame and embarrassment about, you know, the bridges that I burned mm-hmm. and the relationships that I kind of felt like I a lot ruined. Of, a lot of shame and guilt. Yeah. Which, yeah. which I, sh- when you have a mental illness, it's not you, it's not your fault. It's not, I mean, purposely not taking your medication is your fault. I mean, yeah, that's you should, you. You, yeah. you should not do that. Um, but mental illness is not like a fault you shouldn't be held accountable for having an illness like you wouldn't hate someone because they have cancer you know um so i did go through therapy for a lot of that um i'm not currently in therapy i do have a psychiatrist okay that prescribes me medication and i talk to her once a month okay um but that's about it yeah i mean that a good psychiatrist is hard to come by too that i will actually talk to you and not be a drug dealer because i've had those right or there's just like, I was there for like five minutes and, and they're like, here's this. Yeah, here's this. <laughs> Get the hell out. Like, right. I was like, what? No, she's really good. She yeah. takes like a full half hour yeah. to like talk through stuff. So is mine. Yeah. Mine's, mine's cool too. And I, for a little while I was, I was just doing that. And then she's like, 
I think you benefit more when you're doing when you're doing therapy too. I'm like, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> so I started going to therapy again because cool. I took like a couple of months off and I was like starting to notice some things and um and comedy is therapeutic. Don't get me wrong, but it's not. It's not <laughs> I need, the same. I, I need more than that. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. So well, that's good. I've been doing talk therapy through actually through the through the employee assistance program at work so i'm not paying for it so. oh that's awesome yeah. very cool yeah so i'm okay i'm using that um because not a lot of people use that and it's there for everybody i've talked about it before i've talked about it before but i keep talking about it just because it's important uh because mo and i work with employee benefits and i we're a third party and we work with hundreds of companies and um each company that i've worked with has an employee assistance program and they if you're a full-time employee even a part-time employee you have access to that and it's free and they'll give you depending on the plan you can have like five sessions i've seen for free um virtual or in person they'll set you up with somebody um it could be for you know one of your dependents child spouse um or yourself or all together family therapy or uh couples counseling all that stuff's included and they'll like i said they'll get you a good amount of sessions and they'll even add sessions if there's like a life event which is what i did uh because i had to switch therapists so they added 10 more sessions for me for free i was only i only had six okay and um there's some companies that like right out the gate I can't remember the name of the company, uh, but they give you like 20, 25 sessions for oh free. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah, That's nice. That's really nice. Yeah. And it's because um, I mean, most insurance will cover therapy, but like a lot of these companies are going to high deductible plans. So until you meet your deductible, you're paying for those visits uh, and they get expensive. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at like, I remember my therapist. Uh, that I was seeing for a while, like he was in the network of my insurance, but my deductible was higher. So every time I saw him, it was one hundred and sixty two dollars. Oh, my gosh. For, that Yeah, that is for an up. hour session. That, yeah. But I had a health savings account. So I used that. But it was still like I was paying for it. But I pay a low premium for my insurance. But it's kind of a if you do the math, it's really not that big of a difference in spending. Um, then getting like a more expensive plan, you're actually paying more in the long run. Mm -hmm. It's really weird, but a lot of companies are going to that, and some people don't have the means to set that money aside for therapy, whether it is tax free or not. And that's where you can use the employees program because it's, like I said, it's free. The company's awesome. the company's already paying for it. Like they're literally already paying for these sessions. You might as well use them. Exactly. Very cool. So something good to utilize if you ever just want to, if you're just dealing with, even if you're just dealing with stress at work or life in general and, you know, it doesn't have to be a specific diagnosis and you just want to talk to somebody that's a professional, you can. Just do it. <laughs> Why not? Right. You don't have to pay anything for it. Zero dollars. And, uh, yeah, luckily my therapist was like, hey, uh, you're out of sessions, but we just started seeing each other because I, I was seeing a different therapist before and you, we also have like multiple topics to cover. So if you call them and tell them it, you have a new topic to talk about and you have a new therapist, they'll add more sessions. I'm like, and I didn't know about that. That is really cool. Yeah. So you just added them on. They just were like, I didn't know how many sessions they were going to give me. They were just like, all right, we're, we'll give you 10 more sessions. And then my plan year is about to, be up too so i think i'll get six more after that so i could yeah i mean i don't know how much i can milk it <laughs> we'll see <laughs> try yeah. i will try yeah because they're only 30 minute sessions that's the drawback okay, okay. uh so you got to kind of get in there and get after it right away right but i can also it's through talk space so i can message my therapist in between sessions if i have questions oh, nice. or something yeah. okay that's very cool yeah i obviously can't blow them up but like can have right like every five minutes <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah he will hate me but yeah <laughs> Probably turn off it, <laughs> disable my uh, my ability to contact him. But 
yeah, having good professionals and yeah, good psychiatrists that actually use that whole 30 minutes because I've had ones that don't. It's very frustrating. Yeah, that is frustrating. Because my psychiatrist is solid. Like I, she's not even in my insurance network. I, I pay good money to see her because she's worth it because she knows me and I've been seeing her for for a few years now. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. It is really worth it when you find a psychiatrist or mental health professional oh. that you mesh well with. Yeah, you got it. You got to stick with that because it's so hard to re- replace them. Yeah, it is. And find somebody else and starting over with somebody else. And I mean, they could send them notes and stuff, but it's still not the same. It's not the same. No. And and I have and for someone who has like a propensity to like get off their medication, like she will not let me. She's so hyper vigilant about yeah. that, which I kind of need that. So that's really I appreciate that. Yeah. And my. That's really cool. And my psychiatrist with me, she knows me so well. She knows that I am in recovery and she knows I, I don't want to have, you know, I'm trying to limit the number of medications that I take and also not, you know, take something that I could abuse, potentially right. abuse. So that's smart. That's nice as well. And she's like, even, and there is one that I, I'm on right now that I could potentially abuse if I wanted to. Um, and she's like, I will cut you off so fast you won't even know. Because <laughs> <like>, <laughs> she knows. She knows. Yeah. <laughs> cool. She knows exactly. Like, if you try to refill this even, like, a couple days early, I will know. Okay. Like, <laughs> I, I, it gets flagged. Like, <laughs> yeah, the pharmacies don't mess around when – and she pays attention. And she can get in trouble. And Yeah. There's a big accountability thing, especially after the with doctors and everything with the opioid cri- crisis. And oh my god, what a mess that is! Whew, yeah, it's still a mess. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm glad I never uh, enjoyed any any of those types of medications. Yeah, because I've heard those are like impossible to stop taking. Well, you could. Yeah, the withdrawals are just so brutal. Yeah, that's yikes. I've heard so many bad stories about them. Like, thank God I never got into that. I was in more of a I want to stay up. I want to stay awake. I don't want to go to sleep. And mm-hmm. yeah, the painkillers. I the only time I ever took painkillers was when I was prescribed, and I got my wisdom teeth out, and they made me feel like garbage. Really? Yeah. So you were like, I'm not gonna abuse these. Like this? Uh, not yeah. my thing. <laughs> no. Like, I don't get that. But yeah, they're very, very addictive. And for a while, they knew how addicted they were, but they were still giving people, and it's bad. There's several documentaries on. I need to watch. There's one particular for somebody who's told me about that I need to watch, but yeah. Well, a lot of the, then some of the pharmacies get sued and then some of the pharmaceutical companies got yeah, sued. Yeah, I know the had companies to pay a lot did, of money. Yeah. Which is good. They should be held accountable. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So many people are still, well, yeah, they're not even, well, they're not taking the prescription anymore. They're just doing heroin and it's, it's a terrible. And, and everything's laced and it's just gamble completely. i know it's like fentanyl is like fentanyl killing is everyone yep. Jeez. yeah if i ever wanted to go do a conspiracy podcast i would talk about how what i believe about fentanyl because it's, oh. it's a whole <laughs> it's a whole thing it's a whole rabbit hole tinfoil hat <laughs> theory that i have oh man <laughs> but it's scary regardless of where it's coming from why it's happening it's scary mm-hmm. and uh Luckily, you can get, like, if you are somebody that uses uh, and is stuck and, you know, hasn't been able to quit yet, there are test strips you can get from, like, QC Harm Reduction. There's harm reduction uh, organizations throughout the United States that will give you test strips that you can test your stuff with before you do it so you can make sure you're not doing something that's laced. Oh, good. Um, I have a... I had Liv Caro on here, who's the president of QC Harm Reduction. She talked about that. I had known about it before because my friend Jess does it. And uh, so, there's, yeah, there's there's a stigma on that, too, because people are like, oh, because they give out, they do a needle exchange, too. Okay. And people are very like, oh, uh, they're enabling them. I'm like, they're not enabling them. They're already doing it. They're just. Right, they're just making sure it's safe. I'm trying to think of how we want to wrap up any. Uh, any anything you wanted to get out there uh any words of encouragement that you have for anyone that might be maybe struggling right now or dealing with the the stigma of of getting help i i really push like you know 
don't be afraid to ask for help. I know a lot of people say that and it's kind of cliche, but it's just, it's true. Not even just like with mental health, just like don't let your pride get in the way of getting you help or, Mm -hmm. you know, getting to a better place in your life. Yeah. It's, I mean, if you're, if you're struggling, I know it's kind of hard because when you're so lost from reality and you don't think that you're crazy, you're obviously needing help, but you don't think you need help. So it's hard to get to that point where you're finally like, okay, obviously I need help. Yeah. Um, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, social security disability. I was on that twice in my life. Um, if you cannot work because you're so displaced from reality, that's a resource that's out there for people with severe mental illness. Um, Vera French, I have nothing but wonderful things to say about them. Um, there's just a lot of resources out there. Yeah, there continues to be more resources and it just keeps evolving. And um, as more people continue to talk about it and uh, seek help, the more resources and it's like a supply and demand thing right now. You know, there's a demand for, you know, more mental health specialists, psychiatrists, therapists, just because if you try to get in some places, there's a waiting list just because there's not enough people doing it. Right. That's because more people are seeking help. It's a good thing, but a bad thing at the same time. Right. So if you're wondering what to do with your life, yeah. go into mental health treatment now. <laughs> well, yeah, if you're interested at all, I mean, you might even be able to get it. I, I've talked to my psychiatrist about it because I've even thought about it. She's like, you could probably get it paid for like at this point, like the government. Because they want people to do it. They want people to do it. Yeah, that's cool. But it's like doctorate level. And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> that's hard. That's that's seven years. Of, that's a lot of school. <laughs> I mean, I have my bachelor's, but it's just like still. Yeah. Maybe down the road. I'm not ready yet. <laughs> but. I appreciate you taking the time yeah, on, a fr- so on a Friday much. night and, and dealing with my uh, my changes in schedule. So I appreciate you having me on. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, it was awesome. It was good to have a conversation uh, about something that I didn't, I haven't been able to have a direct one on one conversation with somebody with that diagnosis. So that's really cool, and I think a lot of people will benefit from he- hearing about it from learning about it and you know they may may, we may have somebody that listens to the podcast be like oh man finally i can i get to hear more about uh, that thing yeah i get to hear more more about something that i get uh, that i have to deal with you know not get to deal with and there is a social media account there's a instagram account called living well with schizophrenia oh yeah there's a lot of cool accounts for different diagnosis Yeah. yeah that one is really really good if you're looking for more information because they give a lot of education and stuff yeah that's really cool yeah i've seen a lot of cool ones for ocd it's uh, there's ones for add adhd yeah so that's cool that they have one for schizophrenia yeah 